chips, relax, and enjoy the conversation with the guys and the mayor. show for the new season but it was only right that we have the mayor of our city Rochester New York none other than our mayor lovely Ann Warren hi hi I thank you for coming listen I feel good <laughs> well, I put on my time this man you know he didn't respect the, he didn't respect the office you know what I'm saying <laughs> had to put on the time and everything but we are here with her I'm so happy you know we've been trying to get you for a long time you know your schedule is everywhere so first I want to say I appreciate you I appreciate you even having us here. Appreciate you being on the show, and I appreciate what you're doing for our city. I really do. I really do. You are a uh, what do you call her? She's a phenomenal woman. Yes. Phenomenal yes. black woman. Yes. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yes. So listen, get your tea. What you what you call it? Get your what? What you tell me? Get your drink. Get your chips. Go yeah. to the bathroom. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> the Nicole Chronicles is coming. anything about this show as Chris already told you we are in City Hall we're not paying any taxes but we are paying <laughs> a visit to our mayor listen I don't know any city that has a mayor like this one right true but true. but we are here and we're gonna rock out and we're gonna do the show like we normally do the show oh, but you know what before we do this uh, forgive me mayor this is, how can I put it, our new friend. <laughs> my new friend. Introduce yourself, man. He said he wanted to meet you. <laughs> my name is Ray Capone. I'm new to, to General Chronicles, and I'm also new to Rochester. Mm -hmm. I've been here about 18 months ago okay. for a wonderful opportunity. I'm loving the city, and I'm loving my job, and really loving the, the heart of Rochester. Mm -hmm. That's all Where did you move from? Uh, new Jersey. As you can tell by accent, actually, yes. <laughs> I'm a very strong northern New Jersey accent, almost New York City. Uh -huh. And uh, you did 53 years in, I could have shaken it a little bit, but not at all. <laughs> but you got a lot of swag with you. I see, I yeah. see. Yeah. 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 Welcome, Ray. Glad to have you. Glad to be here. Glad to meet you as well. So let's get started. So, 
so Facebook, you guys sent us some, some more questions, um, some things you wanted us to, to talk about that we didn't talk about last season. One, ladies, you want to know how do we feel as men when our women make more money or has a powerful position uh, than we do. So I'm gonna start with me. Mm. <laughs> you know, my ex-wife made more money than me. I ain't a problem with it. Uh, Longs as it doesn't go to your head. I think that's where the issue is. Who's At that? home, Who's the woman. That? Uh, I'm still the man of the house. Uh, I mean, but we're supposed to be one. So okay, it's fine. Yeah, yes. fine. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not the you know telling you what you can and can't do type thing. But I believe that's what the Bible says. That I'm the head. You're definitely not the tail. You're the neck. I can't turn without you. So a lot of people don't see it that way. Well, they don't live with me. So. Well, so what were your expectations? I mean, when you say that you, I mean, I, mean, I get the, the head of the household and, and all that. I thought I started making more money than me. Right, when you say that you don't want it to go to your head, what does that mean? I don't want you to hold it against me. You know, if we have a disagreement or if there's a purchase, well, it's my money, I made. You know, I, I, which I've been doing. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. You know, I, I, I get that. I you know. agree with that. Well, I know when I was married, my ex-wife made me. Um, and it didn't. It didn't happen to after me. I got divorced. I started making more money than her. So, but while we was married, I never really, I never had a problem like that. I, I never did. You know, I, I come from a family. My dad, you know, retired military. My father used to tell me all the time. He ain't never seen his paycheck. The mother take care of the money. He said, "Be good." You know, he's like, "You don't matter me." He said, "Loan the bills, you pay." Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt, no doubt about that. Yeah. But so I know for me, bro, I uh, I've always wanted my wife to make more money than me. But you wanted her to? I always wanted her to. But you know, I was always I was also told, "Be careful what you ask for." Right. <laughs> right. 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 I mean, um, I guess I always felt well. I have a decent job. Really, I'm not complaining at all whatsoever. Uh, but I know if she's making more than me, then we can probably do more things, is all I'm saying. That's, that's the aspect I come from. If she's making more than me, that means we, we're probably making a, a really decent amount of money. We could just do what we want to do. Especially if she's good. Especially if she's good. And she's good, but she's excellent with money. Excellent with money, trust me. They checks. You like Chris Dad. Yeah. Listen, long, listen, yeah. long, listen, long as I put my more control to see you come on. It's no way. I'll make it work. Right. You know, <laughs> Mary just said something. My dad does that to this day. He said, listen, your mother, what she does, she gives me the credit card. She's okay, Gene, you got this much, this much, you got a thousand dollars, whatever for this month. After that, your long allowance is cut off. They've been married 42 years. So they must be doing something right. Yeah. They must be doing yeah. something right. Yeah. She, she's, she's good on the big purchases. Yeah. You know, like, okay, we're going to buy this at that day. We're going to save up to buy this at that day. Those kind of things. Excellent. Well, when I get married, she got to be good money too. Cause I like the clothes. I like stuff. <laughs> so, Ray, are you married? I am divorced. Uh, I was married about eight so years. So I'm a little bit concerned. Ray, <laughs> <laughs> you are divorced. I'm not exactly. No, no, no. He's married. The three of you. The three of you. Are you talking about your ex-wives? Uh, we need to talk about okay, why you divorced? But okay, go ahead. <laughs> When we first got married, we were fairly equal in, in wages, the two of us. I had this ingenious idea to, to go into sales and took about an $8,000 a year cut pay at the time, which made me the lesser of the two. And I got to tell you, we never fought about it, she never put it in my face, but, but I wasn't necessarily all that comfortable with it. I was pretty happy the day that I crossed the threshold back over her. <laughs> we were always close. There was never a huge disparity in our incomes, even when I made more than her. Uh, so it wasn't that bad. And uh, I've done fairly well since then. But, uh, I think a lot of guys feel as though if the woman's making more than, the, than he is, they can feel less of a man. I don't understand why. Well, I think that's a societal thing, though. Yeah. I don't that's that's that that's that's that. Sure. That. You know, in, in nowadays, nowadays, I sound like I'm a million years old, but, but now, Society is so blended with everything that we do and with the roles that we play, with, with dads being home and moms being at work and, you know, she's, she's got the degree so she's, she's got whatever, she's making more money than you are, so you're, you know, all that stuff has changed. I don't think it's as, uh, as personal an item as it is, or, as, or our society looks at it as the way they used to. But when I got married 20 years ago, it definitely was still on that threshold. 
I, I, I tend to agree with you. It's not, you know, dads are stepping into um, that role yeah. of being homemakers and taking care of households. Right. And that's part of being the head of the household. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make more money to be the head of the household. There are things that you do that make you that. Right. And so I think that that's that position that you, that you hold. Um, and the right. respect that the, the woman should have for their, their mate is to not, you know, make that an issue. Right. We're in this together. You know, the sure. Bible says, when, you know, when you get married, two become one. So, so yeah. you have to focus on it. Well, I don't think all the women follow that. <laughs> I don't think they follow that. They got a secret account somewhere with some money stashed. No, I didn't say that we can have secret account. See? Listen. Yeah, listen. Some, sure, listen. Listen. Sometimes you can thank God for that secret account, but you might ain't got it. Absolutely. When the car breaks down and you need some breaks, you be like, honey, uh. <laughs> you know, my grandma pulled up. I'm going to go get it real quick. Let me, let, me, right. let me go and, and help you out. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, we are going to take a quick break so we can continue this conversation. We'll be back in two seconds. <laughs> Now, some are le legit, you know, they're taking advantage of, but some are trying to get 15, 20, 30 minutes of fame. Well, I mean, you have to look at the Me Too movement is about the total circumstances. When you think about the way that women have been objectified, the way they've been, been treated, the way that even to this day, women, many women for the same job, with the same qualifications, don't want to earn the same amount of money as the men that are in those positions. Um, the fear of, of, of losing, losing your position if you speak up and speak out. Um, and so you're talking about the total circumstances in the culture that's behind it, that this was accepted. That if you're a woman, that you have to look a certain way, you have to dress a certain way, and you have to allow yourself to be treated a certain way in order to advance. And that was an accepted culture across the board. I mean, if you look at music videos, you look at the industry, you look at even in corporate America, all those things, it's a, a man's world. And you're trying to break into that man's world, but understanding that you have a, a role to play there. Um, and if you step outside this box or this role, then you can lose everything, and some women have. And so it's not about the individual cases that may or may not have been me too. It's about the fact that this is truly a situation that has been accepted. And women are just saying, not anymore. And we're not going to tolerate it. Did we tell y'all our mayor was a lawyer? Or is a lawyer? <laughs> yeah, that was spoken like a lawyer right there. I mean, that, that kind of blew me away. Yeah. I'm seeing like, you see when you say a word, we like, hey, look. Teach us, teach us. Yeah. The mayor is correct. Sometimes the, uh, these individual stories, and we can pick on one if we wanted to, which we're not, uh, we get sucked into the details of those stories and we, and we dissect it and we tear it apart. And we tear it apart 
in some cases, the victim, we challenge the legitimacy on the level of victimizing that that person had. And, and so when you take a movement like this and you dissect it one at a time, it loses its total effect. It's the same thing with Black Lives Matter or any other movement. If you start taking some of these individual things and rip them, rip them to shreds, you lose what the overall movement is about. She defined what the overall movement is about, what the overall offense is about, as eloquently as it could be, as it could have been described and defined. And I, and I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and truly, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Exactly. I think a, a, a one of the main things I think a man, a man should do is listen. Don't downplay. It. Listen. Yeah. Listen. And you think about it. I mean, it amazes me the number of men that I hear. You know that. You know, look at this as like, oh my goodness. You know, people are making a big deal out of this. Right. And, and, I, and I say, listen. Do you want your daughter to be treated this way? And ninety nine point nine percent of the time, no, I don't want my daughter to be treated, sure. treated like that. The things that you might do to women as men, you don't want another man doing to your your daughter or your, your child. And my daughter, and, my sister, my mom. Right. You know, I, mean, I, I have daughters, and you know, of course never want them to be treated that way. But I guess more importantly, I have to teach my son, this is what not to do. This is how you handle this situation. So I'm working on the next generation of me to say, okay, you know, that was then, this is now, so we, you can't treat ladies like our grandfather used to right. do, great grandfather right. used to do. And, and as my daughters, I have to say, well, you know, you know, there's certain things you don't have to put up with anymore. Sure, I mean, glass ceiling is glass ceiling for a reason, so you can see through and break it, mm -hmm. as opposed to just a, a brick wall. Good. And I think for me, being a fact, I don't have any biological kids, but you know, I get my work at Burgess High School. I work with a bunch of young men. It's my responsibility to my young men all the time. Well, to be a man, you gotta see a man. So therefore, we have to be around real men that make real decisions and yeah. own up to it. If you messed up, okay, I messed up, I'm sorry. You know, or, Say, you know what? No, I'm not gonna do this. You know, I'm not I'm not gonna violate you, I'm not gonna do this. Like she said, you know, you want nothing to your daughter or your mother. Right. But really, most of this stems around care. It's all about character. If uh if, if I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do in the light, I need to do what I do. Same thing in the dark. Absolutely. Uh, don't speak out of one side and mean something out of the other. Right. You know, that kind of thing, you know. Because uh if I think I'm not gonna point your fingers, call them names, but some of the things that happened in the past, and we see all these court cases coming up now. Right. Uh, a lot of those things, they spoke st strictly to character. You know, you, you you're so you one way in front of the camera, and then after, outside of the camera, or behind the curtain, you know, used to be somebody totally different. It's like you know, schizophrenic. I don't know. But well, that's a culture that was it is. accepted it was. Yep. in in that industry. And I was listening to I can't remember the the pastor that that talked about this, but he said um, proper content builds proper character. Mm. Proper character leads to proper conduct. Yes, really. And so if the content, like you pouring into your son, you're pouring into the young men at the school, if the content that you're pouring into them is not proper, then you can't build proper character. You can't expect her, yeah. And then if you don't have proper character, then you can't expect that conduct that they're showing and displaying to be of you know the, the way in which we would, would like that to happen. So, so <laughs> that's good stuff. So and, and we do we have challenges speeches. today. We have we have huge challenges with that because television and videos and so on and so forth still objectify. You know, Me Too movement hasn't curbed that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still objectified women in, 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 in a way that young men uh, almost can't control mm -hmm. their urges, so to speak. They're encouraged to. So it's we have and we as as men as as mentors to these young men, whether they're our children or they're our cousins or our, or our neighbors or whatever, we have an obligation to try to kind of tamper that down and explain to them. Entertainment is entertainment, and the way we're supposed to behave is not. Well, the best control is self-control. So Correct. You got to be able to instill that to the to the men these days, the young men. Listen, this is deep. She's y'all. She's dope, right? <laughs> Talk like tone, right? She's dope, right? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're gonna take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to get into a little bit more, all right? We are back. 
kicking it with the mayor. Uh, she's none, uh, none that you would expect to be the mayor. She's, <laughs> she you? is, huh? When the real band come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> oh, he's getting ready to come out. So I question, <laughs> the question that y'all sent to us. Um, how do we feel, men feel about women in power? And do how, how does women feel about being in a male dominant uh, uh, field? Now, for me, it depends on what the power is. Now, we're talking about the bedroom, then that's something totally different. <laughs> um, but now, uh, we know that our last mayor uh, was a guy, and we now have a beautiful woman. Uh, it helps that, you know, the mayor is easy on the eyes, on the eyes <laughs> and we have a dress. Um, Praise God. But, gentlemen, how do you feel about <laughs> I'm trying to get myself together. Because you're talking about, you're talking about, the bedroom for real? The bedroom for real? Well, y'all wanted Van Dell, Star Jones. So, we have, we show I mean, for me personally, I come from strong women anyway. So, it's it's almost normal. You know, my mother, when we're talking to my grandmother, you know, she was, you know, the missionary, and she's a preacher, you know. She took everything, you know. Then you have my mother. We don't want to think about them in the bedroom. But I ain't took out of it. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, then you got my mother. You know, she's a career woman. Uh, she's a nurturer, and she's just a strong woman. So I'm used to that. So to have a mayor that way, you know, you know, I, I love women. So therefore, you know, she put the mother touch on. I'm like, okay, do that, do that. You know, so it's, it's cool with me. I, I love it. And as far as the bedroom, I'm cool with that too. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't got nothing to say. Hold on. And this is why. <laughs> the, my take on having a, a female role model for a female leader is one of uh, I know the nature of a woman is to nurture. Right. Uh, that's just a God given trait. So for our man to be, of course, a, a female. I, I believe it adds a certain touch to our city. Right. Um, the way she acts and reacts to certain things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how people come at her, but you know, you know, That's any it. kind of way. We said it on and, Sunday. And leave the same way. Like, hey, you want to build. Yeah. We want to build. We want to build. But, 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 I got to pay my own money. You know what I mean? We ain't got to do today. But you will not. Feel it. But this is my point. I, I, I look at our female leader as, as a role model. I have daughters. I have daughters, and I want to push my daughters as far as they'll go. Right. I have one daughter. She has a master's degree, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to get her to go to the doctor. She is fighting, and kicking against it, but I'm trying to get her. You try to do. It. I say, do it while you're young, you know. Right. See how right. But you know, again, role models are everything, and we all, whether we whether we know it or not, we all are some kind of role model for somebody that's always watching us. So to have our First lady of the, of the city, right. you know, to to, to be as as, as uh, powerful as she are with the, uh, the elephants with the lifted trunks and all that. You know, <laughs> we, know, we know where we're going with that. But, you know, <laughs> but it's, it, you know it's, it's a part of showing the world that it can be done. Right. You know, and start at a local level, we can build up from there. But yeah, nature to nurture, I love it. I love it. So, let me ask you a question. I mean, you took over being the mayor. Um, how did the the male's tradition? Um, so it was, I don't think it was a male-female thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was being the first African-American female, the first female elected to, to become mayor of the city. Um, it was it was historic. Right. But Rochester has always been a very progressive city when it came down to um, balancing or how um, we had a female county executive, um, Maggie Brooks was the right. first female, and now we have uh, Cheryl Denoffel. Um, when I was on city council, um, and I was city council president, we had more females on city council than men. Um, our congresswoman, um, who just passed away a, a couple months ago, Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. So for us, um, it was very, it's a very progressive, um, equal rights to be as it pertains to women being in leadership roles. So I don't think that that was a, a challenge. Um, I think that more so um, was a challenge was was the race issue. Um, wow. You know, there are many um, different rooms that I walk into today that I'm the only African American. 
Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of women leaders that are in executive positions that, you know, head of nonprofits, organizations, and, you know, Ursula Burns um, being, you know, you know was the, the head of Xerox. So, um, in, in many of our, our companies, you have women in, in leadership positions. Um, for me, it was more so that I'm an African American woman that um, is coming in here, and then I upset the apple. And so, you know, I, I, I broke the mold and, um, you know, basically um, the status quo was unacceptable. And so it was a challenge. It was something that I had to learn. Um, I, I really had to learn how to come into the role and to grow into the role because um, it was tough. It was, it was hard. Um, but I truly believe that, um, that I was walking out of faith and that God had my and that um, when you walk in faith and when you believe that your your mission is not for what what am I doing for myself but what truly am I doing for the next generation you know I have a daughter who's eight years old that is growing up in a city and so this city was very very good to me it was good to my family my 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 grandparents moved here from King Street South Carolina with my, my mom and her brothers and sisters, my father moved here from Trinidad, um, became an engineer, was working at Xerox, and my mom worked at Kodak. And so this city was where I grew up. I love Rochester. It's the reason why I decided to return home. And so when I returned home and I started to see and hear the negative thoughts about our community and about um, our city and, you know, the what I felt, that Rochester pride, that Rochester hope was you know, diminished and the next generation didn't see it. They didn't see opportunity, they didn't see advancement, they didn't believe that they could achieve whatever dream that they had. Um, I, I start to feel bad and it's the reason why I got into, or that I ran for office, but also I had a great mentor, someone named David Gant, who um, was the first and still the only African American elected to state office from, from Rochester. And his whole thing was, it's not about you, it's truly about what can you do for the people and what will be that that legacy. And you ever think that yeah, your your great great grandparents believed that slavery would be over or that Harriet Tubman believed that slavery would end or that women would get the right to vote or all those things they fought and many of them never saw the day, but they believed there would one day be a day. And actually there was. You know, I was elected I believe a hundred and one 107 days to the very day that Susan B. Anthony cast her illegal vote in this wow. city. To the very day. God's plan? God's plan. So, so as far as uh, the kickback, pushback, do you experience a lot of that? or? Um, I, you, you experienced it in, in the beginning, and I think that, um, you know, some people in the, in the first four years wanted me to fail. Uh, they they wanted, um, but I think that for the most part, people recognize that the people elected me. We live in a democratic society, we live in a democracy, and so therefore, because the people elected me to be here, that they were going to help me, and there's no way that one person can do it by themselves. You need, um, in, in this world, you need everyone to put their hands on the plow and, and move in the same direction. And so, you know, businesses and, and leaders and um, people came around and said, how can we help? You know, we know what the challenges are, what are, you know, but we also know that we have great opportunities in this city. And so when I say to young people, you know, and I walk into a room and, and people talk about, okay, all the, all the bad things that happened in the city. I, I, it was funny because my, I, my daughter came home one day and she was talking about, I said, how did your day go? So she was telling me everything that went wrong. I said, listen, for the next two weeks, when I ask you how your day goes, I want you to tell me three positive things first. Okay. Okay. And we have to change that mindset. Mm -hmm. And we have to change the mindset that if we always look at the glass as half empty, it will always be half yeah. empty. Yeah. If we look at the glass of half full, we recognize, okay, how do I, what do I have to do to yeah. now fill this glass? Yeah, there you go. There you go. And like See why she's our mayor? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say something else in my office. <laughs> I, I mean this. I really mean this. Um, I was moving back to Georgia because I was fed up with Rochester. I'm sick of Rochester. Just that and the other. But 
being who you are in the thing that you've done in the city, I made my decision to stay with you. Because I'm now I'm getting more, because I said them all the time, I said, I don't do nothing, I'm going nowhere, I don't need nothing by just nothing to do. But because of the thing that you that you put in place, different things for the community, concerts or, or whatever, you know, I'm I'm loving my city. There's a lot of things really? to do in yeah, the city. We have Rock right. the Park coming right. up, right. Puerto Rican right. Festival right. this weekend, Neo Park Avenue Festival, yeah, right. Care Fest coming up, we have a big concert, awesome. you know, um, and, and you know, really there's a lot to do really in our community if you want to really do something. It's not the normal stuff that we right. do. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, we have like the Strong Museum upstairs. I mean, it's I true. used to play Contra all day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mario Brothers, yeah, they you go all up that. there and you yeah, can play video yeah. games. Um, when I was younger, you can go and take a, a nice walk. The cost of living here is great. Right. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the commute time. Um, all those things are really, really good about our, our community. We have great access to nat natural resources. Sure. I don't want to have to worry about a hurricane. I don't sure. want to have to worry about yeah, a flood. True. I don't want to have to worry about a tornado. Um, I don't and want the inner loop is back open. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, so all those positive things that, that happen and the people here, we're resilient. Right. And you know the difference in what happened in other cities and what happened here in Rochester, yeah. unfortunately, was that the change for many cities, it was like in Buffalo, the steel plant closed and that was it. Everybody got laid off, the town mm -hmm. changed, and then and there was a downturn. And so their recovery had to happen earlier than us. When we had, we were, we're a city of intellectuals. We're a city, city surrounded by 19 colleges and universities. We have That's more, wow. more think about that. <laughs> than, you know, per capita than, than any other city. And so we were the intellectual city. So. Kodak laid off 5,000, maybe Xerox laid off 5,000. So the, the drain, it was a slow drip. And we didn't recognize it until one day we woke up and was like, oh my gosh, what happened? Well, today, just as many people that were employed at Boston Line, Xerox, and Kodak are now employed in this community by smaller businesses, by smaller manufacturing companies. And that needs to be noted. Do we have a long way to go, absolutely, because you have some people that are being left behind in the income divide. And um, there was a segment that was taken care of um, during, you know, with Kodak on the line with manufacturing and were able to take care of their families by earning a, a living wage. That's what we're dealing with now, trying to play catch up to bring those people that have been left behind up so that they can participate in the economic recovery of our city. Listen, the mayor has given us so much. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back with some final words. illustrious mayor said last words. Well, I, I want to thank the gentleman, Cole Chronicles, for coming to City Hall, for visiting. Nice. This has been a great um, a great meeting, a discussion, and I appreciate um, all the things that you all are doing in our thank community. You. I remember our distinguished gentleman event, and you brought a young man in there with his. Sharp, he was sharp. sharp. He was so that young sharp. Man was sharp. He was the <laughs> best dressed young man in the place. So I just want to tell you for your public service, we appreciate that. For people that are watching, that are uh, thinking about coming to Rochester, I invite you to come to our city to enjoy our city. And I tell our citizens that there is not a military drone that is in the sky that doesn't have a piece of Rochester in it. There's not a grocery store that you can go to that don't have a piece of Rochester in it. It's not a telephone that you can pick up or a cell phone that you can pick up that does not have a piece of Rochester in it. And so when I think about our community and the legacy that we have here, the legacy of 
Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, the legacy of protecting people and advancing people. There is no other city like the city of Rochester. I am happy that the citizens of Rochester chose me to lead it and i um, looking forward because I can guarantee you the best is yet to come. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm spilling some of that for a sermon. <laughs> listen, I use the end with my, my trademark, but I ain't gonna say that. All I'm gonna say is, may I love me. Yeah.